right, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, we're gonna pick up with our f solve stuff. We're gonna probably wrap that up um, today and tomorrow. Uh, and then, actually we're already in week nine. So we'll have this week and then we'll have week 10 as well. And then after that is finals week. So where we're headed, at least in the immediate term, is we'll finish up the f solve stuff today and Wednesday. Um, and then we'll do fun funds on uh, Wednesday and Friday and probably Monday. Fun funds are function functions. It is actually, if you type help fun fun in MATLAB, there is a fun fun command. Um, those are the anonymous functions that I've made reference to a couple of times previously. Uh, and those will be what show up on homework six. So homework five is posted now. It's three problems on F-solve and it's due on Monday. And then homework six will come out Monday. That one you'll only have like five days to work on because it'll be due on Friday. Um, but it should go a lot faster, not because it's easier or harder, but because the syntax of anonymous functions is so much faster uh, than the other stuff. And it'll primarily be repeating problems from previous homeworks with an anonymous function syntax so that you can see that was actually a lot faster to do it that way. Um, so there will be six homeworks and the last one will be due on the last Friday of class. Um, probably the last Wednesday and Friday of class will introduce um, ordinary differential equations just so you see the syntax of that and see that it's quite similar to F-solve, um, but the majority of that will be covered in your math class in, I think math 20E is differential equations. Um, so you'll use it more in there and you'll use it more in some of your other classes, but I want you to see the syntax so it doesn't like hit you upside the head when you show up in one of those other classes. Um, as far as the final goes, the only things that I know about the final right now are a, it's going to be project-based like the midterm was, so you'll still have a number of days to complete it. Um, and B, it'll be individual, not team-based, unlike the midterm. Um, but other than that, I don't know what else is going to be on the final. It will be cumulative, but I wouldn't let that scare you because kind of everything that we're doing is cumulative, right? If you didn't know how to create variables in week one, you still needed them now in week nine. So don't be like horribly frightened about cumulative because it just code is cumulative. Um, okay, so for our task today, um, I'm just gonna briefly review the F-solve syntax, um, introduce you to the sandwich approach with the, the top bun and the bottom bun, and you can pretty much use that for all of your homework. Um, and then we'll just do a couple of examples for today. Also, if you are on um, Twitch, I am over in Canvas chat, so if you have any questions, uh, you can throw your questions over there and I should be able to see them. Um, so this is a review of the setup that we used for F-solve. So we started off by saying, since we now have a system of equations and a system of variables, we need a way to bundle them together that MATLAB understands, and that system is column vectors. Uh, and we, by default, call those column vectors capital Y so for the variables themselves, we just stack if they're x and y, we stack x on top of y. Same thing, thing for the solution. They're going to come out as a column vector in whatever pattern we've been using. Um, and then same thing for the guess. You put the guess in as a column vector. This syntax for f-solve, because we bundle everything inside of a column vector, that's pretty much the call that we use for f-solve every single time. Um, if we need to pass an additional input argument to our root finding function, we can do that without significantly modifying this call. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much just that. And that's going to form sort of the starting point with our, our sandwich approach that I'll um, describe here in a moment. Uh, and then we did comment that there are a couple of limitations to f-solve that f0 doesn't have. A, you can't bracket the roots, um, which means if there is more than one root, you have to check manually over and over and over and over again, just picking different initial guesses. Um, and because of that, it can be kind of hard to come up with your initial guess. Um, and we'll use fun funds on Wednesday to kind of illustrate a way with at least two variables. You can visualize the solution and figure out roughly where you need to go for an initial guess. But if you do more, I mean, if you do three, like maybe with some algebra, you can work it down to two. But once you get to like three, four, five variables, there's really no visualization tool that's going to help you get started. You just rely on something about the problem um, to help you figure out where to go. So I'm not going to add any notes to this. I'll um, describe the rest of them in um, MATLAB. But this is the, oops, not that, not moving that. 
Um, this is the general syntax that you'll probably end up typing that three times exactly like that on your homework um, because you've got three systems of equations to solve. They all get solved like that. Um, we're going to type it two more times today. We've already typed it like once on Friday. It's just the same thing every time, which is, you know, kind of nice in its own way. All right, let's talk about the, the sandwich approach, which actually works for um, both F-solve and um, F-0. We just tend not to need it uh, for F-0 um, because we have other tools available. Um, but at any rate, you could use it if you wanted to. So step one of the sandwich approach um, is to write the call to F-solve uh, using the standard syntax, um, which is exactly what I just showed you a moment ago, and we'll, we'll write it again here in a moment um, when I start the code example. Step two um, is to define the local function. Um, and so that's the one that we've been calling, for example, RFF, or we've called it myfunk, or we've called it you know, unicorn, or whatever it is you want to call it. Define the local function. Step three consists of two parts. Um, so within the local function, do two things. Uh, the first thing that you want to do inside of there um, is define the individual variables for your problem, whatever that problem is. Um, and you're going to define them from that variable y that we've got. That's the thing that we've been using over and over and over again to sort of lump our variables together. Uh, this is the top bun in the sandwich approach. The next thing that you're going to do, which I'm going to classify as um, 3b, give yourself some space. Then at the bottom, Write your equations in root finding form as rows of your output variable. This is the bottom bun. So we have buns today and fun funds on Wednesday. Step four is the last one that we need to do. Fill in the space between the buns. The reason that I would suggest that you use the sandwich approach is because it helps you avoid problems of remembering what's in what workspace. Uh, in the sandwich approach, the only things that the function starts with are the variables that you define at the top. By the time it gets all the way down to the bottom bun, any variable that was described in there, you need to go back and define it in step four. Right? If it didn't show up in step 3a, and it does show up in 3B, then you have to fill in the extras in between the two. So that, that would just, wherever you go in, in step four. It will not draw functions from, or it will not draw values or variables from the base workspace because you're inside of a local function. So therefore it only has access to its own function workspace. Um, if you're writing this in MATLAB inside of a live script, you can enter uh, examples of code without actually having to code them. Um, if you go into insert and then there's a button called code example here, that's what I'm going to use to write this up. Um, that way this doesn't populate with a bunch of errors or anything like that, but it still gets typeset like code. Um, so if you put code example in here, this is our template uh, for solving systems of nonlinear equations. You can more or less come back to this template every time you need to solve a system of equations. And it actually works for a single equation too. It just kind of simplifies quite a bit um, if you need it for a single equation. So you start off with your y guess and you put your guesses in here um, as a column vector. So remember this is always a column vector. Um, and for us, we're gonna assume that our variables are x, y, and z. So these are gonna be x guess, y guess, and z guess. This is the first place where we establish that pattern. Once we pick the pattern, and it can be any order you want, be consistent. Um, so we could have gone zyx, that would be fine, as long as we always pattern them as zyx. But of course, xyz, 
kind of the, the more obvious one here. This uh, standard syntax that I had referred to up here, that's what I had just shown you over in Excel. Um, and so that looks like y sol is equal to f solve at y of your root finding function. I, let's, I'll leave it as rff and y guess. This is your standard syntax. You can more or less rest assured that it's going to look like that on pretty much every problem that you have to solve. If you ever need to pass an additional input argument, like an A or a B or something like that, you can add that as part of your um, input to RFF, and that's the only place that it goes. You don't have to change anything else about the rest of that. That really doesn't come up all that often. Um, it does, but not often enough that I'm going to include it as part of the template. It's just a reminder that's where it could go. Um, why saw the thing coming out will have um, a particular pattern on it associated with your y guess. So this will come out as x sol, y sol, and z sol. Because again, we set that in y guess to be x, y, and z. So it comes out as x, y, and z as well. So that was um, step, basically step one, which is just using the standard syntax um, to set up our call of f solve. And I added a couple of comments here. Step two is to define the local function. So I'll say function is, uh, let's say, how about output? Or I don't know, out is fine. You can call it anything. It doesn't have to be called out or output or something like that. Um, and we'll call it RFF of Y and N. Now we're within step three. Um, so we're gonna define the top bun and the bottom bun. So our top bun is define the individual variables from, for the particular problem from whatever y happens to be. So here x is gonna be y of one, y is y of two, and z is y of three. Which is not strictly speaking necessary. We can always just go through and refer to y of one, y of two, y of three. The problem with that is it's often easier to troubleshoot and debug your code if it's written in a way that actually looks like what your problem says, right? So that you don't have to do that mental translation of y of one is actually x, and y of two is y, and y of three is z. If you do it once here, you've sort of isolated that assignment and you don't have to think about it again. Step three, give yourself some space. Um, and then at the bottom, write your equations in root finding form um, as rows of your output variable. So this is our bottom bun. Remember, uh, in order to specify that we need a column vector, um, that's gonna look like uh, things along the lines of out of one, one, out of two, two, and out of three, or sorry, out of one, one, two, one, and three, one. We specify the extra index there to force MATLAB to format these into a column vector. If you were to just say out one, out two, and out three, that will, by default, format as a, a row vector, and that doesn't always work with FSolve. A lot of times it will, but then you'll get confused on those times where it won't, and you won't realize it just needed to be a column vector. So now we can write our um, expressions down here. So I'm just going to make some stuff up, right? Maybe it's you know x times y minus z. This would be something like equation one um, in root finding form or whatever, right? We don't actually have an equation here. We don't have equation one. I'm just throwing in numbers here. These equations don't have to use all of the variables. Um, so it could be something like, um, okay, equation one is x, y, and z. Maybe equation two is um, just with x and z. They can also use other variables. So it's not necessary that these equations have only constants x, y, and z. Um, it can have other variables that you define along the way, which is actually the advantage of the um, bun form that we're using here. It could be something like w plus, I don't know, z, z, c0 minus temperature uh, plus 300. All right, whatever equation three is, 
equation three is a function of x, y, and z, but it might in involve parameters that themselves look a little bit weird. Um, they may not directly be written as functions of x, y, and z. And so here we see the uh, advantage of the, the sandwich method. The only thing that the function knows to get started is the current value of x, y, and z. That's at the top bun. By the time it gets down to the bottom bun, which is all your equations, everything that's in here has to be defined. So x, y, and z, those are obviously okay because those showed up up here on our top bun. This one's okay because it's x, z, and some numbers. But this one suggests, well, I'm gonna need to calculate a w, a c0, and a temperature before I ever get down here to the bottom bun. Um, and so that's where step four comes in, which is fill in the space between the buns. So along this particular uh, line, somewhere in between the top and the bottom bun, um, you'd have to define the W, the C0, the temperature, et cetera. If it's a constant, then you just say, you know, C0 is six or something like that. Maybe temperature is itself a function of X, Y, and Z, so you calculate that as you go. But that's sort of the meat in between the top bun and the bottom bun is everything I need to go from the function knowing nothing but the variables all the way down to the actual root finding functions down here at the bottom. And it'll follow that pattern every time. If it doesn't follow that pattern, you're not doing a root finding function or an F solve kind of problem. So I don't know what you're doing, but it wouldn't be surprising if another problem follows a different syntax. This one will always follow that syntax. So I'm gonna leave this here for just a moment because that template is important enough that you should have it copied down somewhere. Um, and then we'll look at our examples for the day. So it won't know until you've set it with y guess. So when we set y guess to have three elements, that sets the syntax for everything else. So we know that it'll have three elements there, and that's how we can write three elements here. Okay, so you don't need to like define something in the function to refer specifically to y guess, not obviously to have that as a function It'll it'll just know that's where I get started. It is kind of interesting, we only sort of uh, indirectly define x, y, and z, right? We never actually need to create this valuable value x, this value y, and this value z. We could always come down here, if we didn't want to call it x, we could always just say y of one. That would do the same thing. And MATLAB won't care if you want to do it that way, it'll read just fine. The disadvantage of this is now I have to make the mental substitution when I'm checking this versus what I wrote on the paper or in the problem statement and say, oh right, y1 was x, so this is actually x. It's just a little harder for me to read, so it's more convenient for us, the people writing the code, to actually call it x. Um, but MATLAB doesn't need to know that, that, that we think of that as x. All right, that's our template. Um, if, again, if you're over on Twitch, uh, I am available on Canvas chat if you have any questions because I'm gonna switch to the other screen. So if you need to see this again, let me know. Um, our first example is sort of a straight math example. Um, so solve these, this system of equations. I haven't given you an initial guess, so I want you to try different initial guesses um, and we'll look at some ideas related to stability uh, because different guesses will give different answers. Um, but please try to start with that sandwich template um, and then see how far along you can get this. I'll come back around, let's say, maybe 3.30, a little bit before 3.30, um, and we'll code up the solution and look at how that behaves, and then we'll look at another example.
All right, I'm going to solve this one inside of the live script. Um, if you chose to solve this in a regular script, your output will show up in the command window. Um, if you choose to solve it in a live script, then your output will show up in the live script itself. Um, they're both equally valid. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, I'll do the live script for this one and the uh, regular script for the next one, um, just so you can compare and, and see what the two look like. Um, so if I want to do the sandwich template, I'll start off with my guess, which we don't know what the guesses are here. It's straight up math, so I'm just going to start with 0 and 0. Um, remember, this will correspond to x1 and x2. So this is where I first set my pattern, um, and I have to remember everywhere else it's always going to look like x1 and x2 whenever I'm referring to that capital Y variable. So the Y solve that comes out here is going to be F solve at y of rff of y with y guess. And then I'm just going to display it here because we don't really need to know what's coming out um, in any more detail than this. But this is going to look like x1 sol and y, uh, x2 sol. More specifically, this is x1 guess and x2 guess. Then I start with my um, local function definition. So it'll be something like out is rff of y throw the end down there on the bottom. Um, and now I do the, the sandwich buns, right? I do the top bun and the bottom bun. The top one is going to be x1 is y of 1 and x2 is y of 2. I give myself some space um, and then I write my um, functions in root finding form as rows of my output variable. So out of 1, 1 and out of 2, 1. And now I can write that first equation 3 times x1 cubed plus 4 times x2 uh, squared minus 145. That's equation 1 in root finding form. I chose there to bring the 145 over onto the left, but you could have done it the other way around, right? You could have done 145 minus 3x1 cubed minus 4x squared, 4x2 squared, and that would be fine. You can go in the, either direction. Uh, this one is 4 times x1 squared minus x2 cubed uh, plus 28. And now I check my sandwich and say, is everything that I needed here already defined, or do I need to add it in, the, in between the top bun and the bottom bun? This one we got kind of lucky on. It's almost like I wrote it that way, that we don't need anything in between the top and the bottom bun. The only thing that our root finding functions require are knowledge of x1 and x2. Everything else in there is a constant, so we don't have to change anything else on there. Um, so this one is pretty much done. This will look fairly similar to the way that problem one looks on your homework in the sense that there aren't a lot of intermediate expressions that you have to try to evaluate. Um, so we can move right along here into the um, analysis of the results. My guess right now is 0 and 0. So let's run that and see what happens. No solution found. That is interpreted about the same way that you can interpret it in plain language. It didn't find an answer. It, it can't work with your 0, 0 guess well enough um, to the criteria within its algorithm to say, yeah, I think I found a, a place where that happens to be 0. This is not at all uncommon. Um, you can click on any of the blue text here. These are all links to things that will try to describe what's wrong. Most of that will not help you fix the problem because it's telling you most likely you screwed up your guess or you screwed up your code, and here's what that meant for f-solve. We don't really care what it meant for f-solve. We just care that it couldn't solve it. Um, so most often that no solution found is interpreted as either you have a bad initial guess or you messed up your local function. This one, it happens to be, I think, that we have a bad initial guess. So maybe instead of 0, 0, we'll go to 1, 1 and see if that does any better. That one works a lot better. What we're looking for is just a plain old equation solved. No caveats, nothing like that. It doesn't say, you know, equation solved, you know, at the initial point or something like that. There's, there's no precondition associated with equation solved. It just says, yep, I figured it out. That's what we want. I had mentioned on the end of Friday's class that one thing that is nice to check for is something called stability. So if you throw different guesses in there, 
they ought to more or less come out to be the same answer. So instead of one, one, I could try one, two. Hopefully if I do one, two, when I display the solution, I'll still get three, four as the answer. So if I do that, sure enough, I get three, four. That's good, right? I could do something like maybe five, two, and let's see if we can break it. Nope, that one seems to work just fine as well. Maybe five, 10, still gives me three, four as the answer. Remember, those initial guesses are just telling the algorithm start here. They have nothing to do, hopefully, with the uh, final values that get printed out here, the three and the four, but that's something you gotta check. Um, you know, another one that you could try would be, you know, minus one and minus two. Let's see if we can break it that way. That one, it did actually give us an answer, right? It gave us 3.45 and minus 0.68, but it also says no solution found. So those numbers are junk, they're trash, they don't mean anything. They're just, that's where the, the solver happened to fail. It was right about there. But it doesn't mean that that's a very good answer. So we should not trust that value uh, to be meaningful and instead probably go back to something like two and two, uh, anything of those positive single digit integers seems to have worked fairly well. So that's an illustration of um, checking for stability. Uh, that one, uh, you know, maybe you could pick ahead of time that it's probably going to have to be positive integers just because you've got cubes laying around inside of your equations. But ultimately, it usually comes down to just trying a couple of different numbers um, and seeing how they work with the, the output values. Remember, the way that we solve this, the 3 is x and the 4 is y. So we would say x is 3 and y is 4. So I'll pause here a minute and close the, or clear the output here in case you need any element of my solution. Um, and then we'll look at another example. So what we'll see on Wednesday is we'll actually come back to this problem, I think. Um, there are ways that we can visualize roughly where should we start that initial guess. The same way that we can plot um, one equation with one unknown and say, I don't know, the root looks like it's around there just from the plot. You can do that with uh, two variables and two equations once we introduce some of those more fun funds um, that we haven't gone over yet. Once you get beyond two equations and two unknowns, if you can manipulate it with some algebra and get it down to two, then you can visualize it. But if you can't, you're just kind of stuck um, and you'll have to come up with good solution or good guesses based on the problem statement. Um, there's, there's no real way around it. That's what's going on in this example, in example two. So this is an example of a typical problem that we would have to solve in reaction engineering. So we've got two simultaneous reactions occurring in a reactor and they proceed with different rates. So R1 and R2 are the rates. And the system of equations that we have to solve are the material balances. So there's four components, there's A, B, C, and D. And so we end up with four material balances, which is four uh, nonlinear equations that have to be solved simultaneously. In this case, the variables we're trying to solve for are CA, CB, CC, and CD. Um, C is usually what we use uh, as a variable for concentration, and then we subscript it with the species. Uh, and we've got some extra um, constants down here. And I've told you to use zero for the initial guess of all concentrations. Uh, and because these are reactors, we have some ways to estimate their um, outputs so that we could gen generate an initial guess like that. Um, but otherwise, for now, you can just take it as that. So let's come back at about for maybe 4.45 um, and see how much of this uh, you can code up. Remember the four equations here, these are the system, this is the system of equations um, that you'll have to solve and you solve them for CA, CB, CC, and CD. And I'll try and zoom in a little bit so that you can 
see those expressions a little bit better. There we go.
All right, if you're watching on Twitch, I know I've messed with my camera here, so it looks a little bit funky, but that's so that we have a little bit of extra room over here. Um, I'm gonna code this one in a plain script so that we can then look at the command window um, to see the output, and it will look more or less the same. It just shows up in a different spot, and I wanted you to know um, that it's still there. All right, so same idea. We start with our YGAS and our FSolve. Those are our standard syntax. So we're gonna start off with Y gas. It's gonna have four components, one each for A, B, C, and D. Uh, and down there at the bottom of our uh, problem, it says use zero for your initial gas. So it's zero, 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 and that corresponds to um, CA, CB, CC, and CD, our initial guesses for those. Our solution doesn't change. Um, what do you want our function to be called? Hat. It's the first thing that I saw. Hat of y, y guess. Actually, hat is dangerous because variables sometimes have hat. Um, cat. cat, perfect. And then we'll just display the answer. In, in here, you'll probably just have to display the answer. Often in like a class, you'll have something to do with it, right? You'll plot it or analyze it or do something like that. Um, and let's save this as example to Sol B, just so I have it here. Uh, and now we set up the solution with the sandwich method. So we say function um, out is equal to cat of y, end. And we create the bottom bun, or the top bun, and then the bottom bun. So CA, uh, that's what I'm gonna use for my variables, just because those are used in the equations. Um, that'll be y of one. CB is y of two. BC and CD. So there's our top bun. Give ourselves some space. And now we write those four material balances um, down here at the bottom as separate rows of our output variable. So we're gonna have out of one, one, two, one, three, one, and four, one because we have four equations and four unknowns. And now I'm just gonna write those using the variables that are there, even though we haven't defined any of those. The reason that I do that is so it's easier for me to find typos, right? If I mess something up, I don't have to look very far to find out that exact equation is written very, very similarly in the paper itself or the problem itself. So V times um, a quantity of CA zero minus CA plus capital V times minus R1. By the way, you could very easily write that if you didn't like that syntax. You could also have written that as minus V times R1. That uh, parenthesis that we put in there to make it V times minus R1, that's a holdover from uh, reaction engineering so that we can see a similarity of it's always a volume times a sum of rates. Um, that's why it looks that particular way. It has nothing to do with how we actually go about solving it. V times minus R1 minus R2. Another little V times this time CC0 minus CC plus V times R1 minus R2. And little V times CD0 minus CD plus V times R2. And so now we've got our sandwich, right? We've got our bottom bun. It's a little bit bigger than the bun in the last one because we've got four equations. And our top bun is another one that's a little bit bigger than before because we've got four variables or four unknowns. Now we do the other part of the only thing the function knows is C, A, C, B, and C, D. That's it. By the time it gets down here to the outputs, everything else has to be either defined or calculated based on nothing but C, A, C, B, C, C, and C, D. That's a convenient way to remember in a, another form that this function has its own workspace. So if it's not CA, CB, CC, or CD, we have to define it. Um, the function won't know about it. So now we can start throwing in all those other values, like V is one and capital V is 100. Um, we've got those four constants, CA zero, CD zero, CC zero, by the way, there's no way to define two variables at once, so I can't write something like this. There, there's no equivalent of that in MATLAB. Some languages you can do that, but 
most of those are what we call computer algebra systems, um, not numerical solvers like MATLAB. Then we also need the R's. Notice the R's are functions of the other, uh, of the variables, C, A, C, B, and C, C, and C, D. So I can say something like R1 is K1 times C, A times C, B, and R2 is K2 times C, B times C, C. In the process of creating the R's, I have defined two more variables that didn't exist before, so I've got to give those some numbers. So K1 is one and K2 is one. And so now you can see the, the sandwich method written a little bit more clearly, or, or I guess demonstrated a little bit more clearly, because there's this bottom bun, there's the top bun, and I wrote enough code to connect the two, right? That's the meat of the code, is everything to go from the top to the bottom. If I did that correctly, um, let me scoot this over a little bit so we can see it. Did I forget an asterisk? Where at? I did, thank you. Asterisk there. So let's go ahead and try and run that and see what we get. Oh, not F4, I don't know what that does. F5. So I ran mine as a plain script, so my results got written to my command window. Um, and so in my command window, I get the best possible output from um, fsolve, which is that it has solved my equation. That's what I wanna see. Um, the next thing that I, of course, check is whether or not these numbers are physically meaningful, which I guess, I mean, given these are concentrations, yeah, they're all positive, so that's good. Um, there are other ways that we can check things, but they're usually specific to the class you're in, so we're not gonna look at it. But again, the way we would um, interpret these is the first one CA, then CB, then CC, and then CD, because again, that's the pattern that we've got. Um, and you would have seen the same thing in a live script. Uh, it just depends on how you wrote it as to whether it shows up in the command window or in the, the live script window. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, if you are on Twitch, I'll stick around in Canvas for a few more minutes in the chat room over there if you have any more questions. Um, but otherwise, when we come back on Wednesday, um, we'll start looking at anonymous functions and fun funds, which are function functions. So um, you've got everything you need for homework five. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye, Twitch. <laughs>